In the examples I'm going to show you, I hope you'll learn that we've developed a method for treating inherited diseases which were previously incurable. This idea was originally borne out in a movie about John and Eileen Crowley and their children with neuromuscular disease. In the movie Extraordinary Measures, the family goes through difficult times, hope, and ultimately success to develop that special medicine for Megan. In a brief segment from the movie, Megan's parents learn there's really nothing more that can be done to help her failing heart and lungs. After all, it's not just her lungs, okay? Her heart, her liver, these organs have been compromised and would have become fatally enlarged. Now, I wish that we had a drug to treat Pompeii, but we simply don't. I'm so very sorry. I wish we had a drug to treat Pompeii, but we simply don't. I'm so very sorry are words you really never want to tell a parent or a patient. We really strive to come up with ways that will help this patient population with what were previously uncurable diseases and others I will tell you about. In the three examples I'll introduce you to, I hope you'll see that there is now, this dream has become a reality. And we can bring hope to families and children who, who bear the greatest burden of this disease. And I hope you can share my enthusiasm with this incredible opportunity to bring new medical treatments to conditions that were previously untreatable. The secret to this discovery lies in our DNA, the DNA we inherit from our parents and our grandparents. The DNA is responsible for coding all of the proteins in the body, shown here as it unwinds and copies messengers which lead to the production of those proteins that make cells and tissues. The code that carries that in, carried in the DNA is really provides for an infinite number of combinations that makes us all unique. Building a protein is a little bit like knitting a sweater stitch by stitch. Sometimes there are errors, like this red yarn shown in a white sweater. Or errors can be more serious, like the one that results in a hat and a glove included into the sleeve. A perfect sweater can go horribly wrong, and it just does not work. <laughs> we now have the ability to diagnose conditions at birth based on genomic information, such as obesity, diabetes, cancer, or even rare diseases. And even though there's caution raised by this Time magazine cover that these tests are not cures, they are the beginning of understanding the conditions that we can now manage and the examples I'll show you. We've really reached a pivotal moment in medicine where the understanding of the fundamental causes of disease can lead to cures. And this, in fact, relies on a leap in technology that allows us to obtain information from the DNA of all the genes we inherit. In the start of this revolution in 1993, the Human Genome Project was projected to cost $3 billion and take over 10 years to complete. Today, the cost of this same piece of information is just $900 and can be done in less than a week. Rare diseases are really where we need to begin because we know that there are very few patients in any one category with a rare disease. And in fact, there are 350 million people worldwide when you consider them all together, 30 million people in the U.S. with rare disease, and half of them are children. In fact, in this room, 100 adults have a rare disease, but they're the lucky ones because the adult population has much milder disease and kids are more severely infected. Sadly, 100,000 children with rare diseases born in the U.S. will not reach their first birthday. I think we finally arrived at a time when we can do something about that. And I'll tell you the three stories that demonstrate that principle. 
The first is about a form of inherited blindness. This condition leads to early loss of vision in a very small number of patients. The first patient to begin in the study we conducted here with members of the University of Pennsylvania was a Canadian named Dale Turner. Dale's experience was really motivating to him and he was a college student when he came here and he described his experience in this brief news clip on the Canadian Broadcasting Company. On day three was um, the actual first day I got to go outside and um, so I took off my sunglasses and I peered into the sky and it, you know the sky was something I had never seen before in, in that I mean um, the color of the blue um, was, was just overwhelming. I mean, it was something that struck me, and it was, uh, it was a very emotional moment. It was just um, the proof was right in front of my eyes, literally. Dale underwent a procedure to deliver the corrective gene for Labor's congenital amaurosis into his eye, the back of the retina. I'll show you a brief animation of how that's done, just so you can get an idea of what it takes. Let me go on to tell you about another condition called congenital AADC deficiency. Congenital AADC deficiency is a condition caused by the absence of an enzyme that's responsible for all the movement in the body. Patients with this problem really have no movement as is shown here in this first child involved in this study. You can see she's not able to interact with her environment and can't even smile. The procedure to treat this condition, like in Dale's case, involves injecting the therapeutic gene into the back of the brain where it travels into the areas where movement is coordinated. The gene, after a few weeks, begins to express the missing protein, and after some rehabilitation, the children have all begun to move, like this one, who's now able to interact sit up, and even smile. The next example I'll share with you from our experience here at the university is in a form of muscular dystrophy known as Pompe disease. If we remember back to our original story, I wish we had a drug to treat Pompe, but we simply don't. We really felt it was necessary to push forward to develop better therapies for this disease. And now, to describe this, you have to understand one of the principal problems is in the heart in these patients. Shown on your left is the heart of a child with a, without cardiac enlargement, and the heart of a child with Pompe is shown here. You can see this tremendous enlargement in the heart is really just not survivable. The first patient to enter into a gene therapy study and to receive the original treatment for Pompe disease is Phoenix. Had Phoenix been born just a few months before he was, the first therapy for this would have not been available to him and he would not be alive today. He's now 10. But each year, the family hopes for a better treatment. And that's what's led us to this gene therapy approach, which now has enabled him to breathe on his own again. In fact, for the first time in many years, Phoenix was able to go out of the house without his ventilator and go for a run with his dad to a nearby park. And to me, that's amazing. For all the kids with Pompeii that are affected from childhood to adulthood, it affects them in different ways. And our hope is that each of these patients will be able to live out their life to the greatest potential. One of the youngest patients involved in the study we're doing now is able to stand for the first time at three years of age. And we hope that this will continue and that he'll be able to run in the future. This is the first time we've had a patient reach this milestone, so this is really encouraging. In fact, we hope that for many conditions, this form of molecular therapy will treat previously uncurable gene diseases, and that, in fact, we know that hope 
is in our genes. Thank you.